we're missing some people. So, much to the delight of everybody who is also in the Java class, we're talking about arrays. Pretty much everything that we did in the Java class counts exactly for this class as well, except you don't have that little helper class. You can't use arrays dot in the exact same way. That doesn't mean that there's not an arrays class, but we're not going to talk about it at this point. So we just need to remember how to declare an array. The syntax is slightly different than it was for the last hour. right? You give the name the type of the array, the name of the array, and then in the square braces you specify the size, and then you can build an initializer list. You can leave out the size declarator and just let the compiler figure out the length based on the number of items in the initializer list. You can specify the length here and give it there. If this value has to be at least that many elements long, so since there's five here, then size would have to be at least five. If size was larger than five, then the rest of the elements would be set to zero. So it would copy these values, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, into that array. And then after that, it would be padded out to zero up to the uh, total length of the array. So to do stuff with arrays, we wind up looping through them. We can loop through the arrays to copy the arrays. We can loop through the arrays to sum them up. We can loop through the arrays to uh, compare them. Using parallel arrays. Parallel arrays, two, more, two or more arrays that contain related data. The two or more arrays of the same size where the elements are linked by their index, by their subscript. That would be my definition of it. Two or more arrays of the same length where the elements are linked by their subscripts. And so you could have an array called first names, right? Where we had Joe. Spiders his first name, and so we have an array of last names. His last name is Man. I know that's stupid. All right. And we could have more first names. Like Peter. And his last name is Parker. And we have Bruce. And Bruce's last name is Wayne, and so on. I'm going to get rid of the Spider-Man. That, that's just too stupid. And let's add Clark Kent. So Clark is the first name. Kent is the last. And we'll add Tony Stark and we'll be done. Tony. Got to mix our Marvel and our DC. All right. So there we go. We have two arrays. Now these aren't properly declared arrays because I didn't give them a data type up in the front. And so since I should do that, string first names, and I have four names there, so I'm going to put the four there, is equal to Peter, Bruce, Clark, and Tony. And then string last names, subscript four, because we have four of them, is equal to Parker, Wayne, Kent, and Stark. So these are parallel arrays. Each one has four elements long, and the elements are thematically united by their index. We could thematically link, um, link month names, you know, with sales or days with, you know, their day names or temperatures as opposed to the uh, week of the year in which case those temperatures occur. So like you could have month names. I'm only going to put four month names rather than a whole bunch of them. String month names. And I'm just going to let the compiler figure out what they are. And so how about Jan, Feb, March, and April. And then we could do rainfalls. Double rainfall for those same months. 
January, we didn't have any rain or snow. February was remarkably wet, and we had 21 centimeters of snow. In March, we had 10 centimeters of snow, and in April, we had one, like that. And then how about temperatures? And so it was 20 degrees out in January, it was 40 degrees out in February, it was 50 degrees out in March, and it was 55 degrees out in April. Something like that. So we could print out a little table that said in January it rained zero inch, zero, and the temperature was 20. In February it rained 21 and the temperature was 40. In March it rained 10 and the temperature was 50. And in April it rained 1 and the temperature was 55. So you can have as many arrays as you want as long as they're all thematically linked. They're all of the same length and they're united by their subscript. So subscript is used to relate the arrays. If you're using parallel arrays, you're not going to use a range-based for loop because you have to have that subscript. Any arrays can be of different types. So here, this is an array of strings. The month names are strings, but the rainfall and the temperatures are doubles. That's okay. They're different types. They don't have to be of the same type. So here's our example. We're going to declare an array of student IDs, a student array, uh, an array of averages, and an array of grades. And then after we do some processing, we print it out. We say, okay, here's their student ID for that subscript, here's their average for that subscript, and here's their grade for that subscript. So obviously there needs to be some more code where we ask for the ID and we ask for the average and we calculate or ask for the grade and we're filling all this information into our array. Arrays is function arguments. You can pass an array in just like you pass in any other parameter, any other argument. If you want the fastest possible performance, you would probably want to pass it in as a reference type. You would want to define it with an ampersand so that you could pass it in as a reference rather than passing it by copy. If you don't do anything special, if you don't declare your parameter as being a pointer or a reference, then it will copy every value of the array in. And if the array is 10,000 elements long, it's going to go ahead and copy in all 10,000 elements when it calls the function. And that's okay most of the time, but if you were going to try to write it to be as fast as possible, you would probably use it as a reference parameter in order to do that. We'll play with writing some functions that uh, accept arrays. So when you pass an array to a function, it's common to pass the array size so that the function knows how many elements to process. Very, very, very common. Because remember, in this language, there's no strict way to get the size of the array out. I can't ask the tests array how many elements are, are in there, and then it tells me there was 10. So I would need to pass in the size as well. And if you're going to do that, then you'd have to uh, put that in the prototype header, right? So if you're going to do show scores, you pass, you define a parameter for both the array name and then for the array size. And then your code in there could go ahead and do something with that. Modifying an array in a function. You're allowed to change. I think I made a mistake in telling you that you ought to do uh, these things as references. Yep, I quite did. Forget everything I said about references as far as this lecture is concerned. Array names and functions are like reference variables. Changes made in the array and the function are reflected in the actual array in the calling function. That means you can change them. You can change the values in the array. You need to exercise caution to make sure that they're not inadvertently changed. So if you're used to the idea that you can make changes to a parameter and it won't affect the argument in the calling code, well, that's not true in arrays. So you need to take care about that. So I'll erase you to create a file if you're going to play long. Are we not? Yep. All right, it's a 
file, new, new project, C++ empty project, lecture S. Solution Explorer because it was closed. If I click add new item. S.cpp. Go and grab my boilerplate. All right, ta-da. Let's declare an array of numbers. Int nums is equal to, and I'm just going to type in some numbers. Doesn't matter what they are. Now I'm going to write a function called reset. And it will set all the values in the array to the specified value. Right, so after it's done, if we, t if we said reset to 1, then all the values would be 1, for whatever purposes. It doesn't need to return anything, so I'm going to declare it as void. It's going to be called reset, and it's going to take an array name, and it's going to take an array size. So int I'm going to use IA for int array. Maybe that's dumb, but anyways. Int IA subscript, in subscript, comma, and then A size. I've decided to make it instead of IA, I'm going to make it AI, like array of ints, and then A size. So I and T space A size. There we go. Alrighty, now I just need a little for loop. It's going to count from zero up to, but not including a size. Assigning, oh, well I said that uh, reset was going to let you specify a value to reset them all to. So how about we add one more parameter, comma, int new value. Every element in the array is going to equal that when we're done with our little loop. So, or ant i is equal to zero, i is less than a size, i plus plus, and then a i, subscript i, is equal to new value. Let's write one called print that'll display the array. I guess we should t test this one out, but I can't really test it until I can print it, right? So, void, not coid, void print. It's going to take an array. So, int ai subscript in subscript, comma, int a size. Ant i is equal to zero, i is less than a size, i plus plus, c out, arrow arrow, a i subscript i, arrow arrow, space quote space quote, and then once it's done printing, I'm going to print out an ENDL. So c out, arrow arrow, ENDL, the next line, like that. And how about a summation? It's going to look so similar to these other two, but it's not going to return a void. I guess since these are arrays of ints, let's make it return an int. So 
int sum, parentheses, int ai, subscript, in subscript, comma, int a size. We need to declare an accumulator. So int total equals zero. Now we need another for loop. I could just copy and paste that for loop from up there. For parentheses, int i equals zero, i is less than a size, i plus plus, total plus equals ai subscript i, and then return total. scroll down and actually try to use these functions. So there's my array. Now I'm going to print it. So print nums, comma, and I should have the length of the array, but I don't have the length of the array. So int a l e n or a -lim is equal to, and how do you calculate the size of an array? We use size of the array itself divided by the size of the data type. So size of parentheses nums in parentheses divided by size of int. Another trick that people do is instead of saying size of int, they will do size of, and then they'll put the array name like this. But I'm going to undo it, so don't necessarily type it like that. The reason they do that is so that they don't have to specify the size, right? They don't have to say that it's an int. That if this array comes in and it's an array of doubles, this picks it up automatically. That's really great and all, but if it's an array of zero length, it would blow up because we would be dividing by, you know, this is supposed to be the first element. But if they're, anyways, I'm going to undo that and I'm going to take it back to the way it was, like that. That is a perfectly good way of calculating it. Okay, so nums, print nums, comma, a length. Now let's reset the array. Reset nums, comma, a length to a value of 7. And let's print it again. Print nums, comma, a length. Let's get the sum. So int total is equal to sum nums comma a length. And then c out arrow arrow sum equals space end quote arrow arrow total arrow arrow endl. So that was our array, and then it turned into all sevens, and the sum of those numbers was 49. I believe it. I'm not going to double check it by hand. If you want to copy an old array into a new one, multiple ways of doing that. The way that the uh, textbook would show us would be to allocate a new array and then copy the elements one by one into it. Let's do that. Let's make a second array called nums copy. Anybody need syntax error correction? All right, so int num copy, or how about just nums2? It would be easier to type right. Nums2 subscript, 
and we need in there to be the size of the array, a length, like that, right? Are you going to complain because this isn't constant? Okay. It doesn't like this because that's not constant. I'm going to see if I can come up here and put C-O-N-S-T here and have that fix the other problem. Yep. So I just changed that line to have the constant keyword to indicate that A length cannot change. And that made the syntax happy down here. And to reset them all to zero, I could use our reset function, or I could just do this. You know, fill it with the declarator, put a zero in the first element, and then you'd list, and then the rest of them would be set back, you know, to a default value of zero anyway. Now, if I'm copying the array, do I even need to take the time to do that? Not really. I'm just going to have a for loop that copies all the values from one into the other. Now, don't type what I'm about to do. Num0 or nums2 subscript 0 equals nums0, right? And then nums2 subscript 1 is equal to nums1, right? That's exactly what I wanted to do. And so on. But I'm going to write a for loop to do that. So, more int i is equal to 0, i is less than a length, i plus plus. nums2 subscript i equals nums subscript i. And I'm going to print out nums2 just to make sure that all this worked. So print nums2. Oh. Print nums2, comma, followed by the size of it. So nums2, comma, a link. And nums2 happened to also be set equal to all those sevens. So, fine. So, for y'all, I'm going to give y'all a little task, a thinking task. Write a loop that will set the elements in the nums to array where the element equals the square value of the index. Take a couple of minutes to see if you can come up with a for loop that will do that. In other words, num subscript 0 is going to equal 0 because 0 squared is 0. num subscript 1 is going to equal 1. num subscript 2 is going to equal 4, right? 2 squared is 4, and so on. 3 is going to be 9, and so on. But write it as a loop. All right, so I'm going to do yet another loop. For int i is equal to 0, i is less than a length, i plus plus nums2 subscript i equals, and we could use the pow function if we wanted to, math.pow, or we could just use i times i, right? And then I'm going to print that array out, print nums2. No, what have I done wrong now? Oh, I keep forgetting to do that. What am I missing here in my print statement? The a link for the right a link. And there we go. 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, and so on. Let me pause for just a moment. All right, so what I want to do now is 
Again, hit the idea of parallel arrays because that's what the homework assignment is going to be based on. And here's what I want to be able to do. I want to be able to track sales. And I want to be able to say that Joe sold, you know, $39 and Mark sold $100 and Jill sold $40 and Sam sold $80. And then I want to be able to calculate the average of sales. I wish I'd chosen numbers that I could actually add up in my head. If I got that right, which I know I don't, whatever. And then the highest sale, what was it? And then the lowest sale. I don't know why I'm bothering to space this out. The lowest sale is 20. That's what I want today's output to look like. So that average is 60, I believe. So I'm going to need a parallel array. I'm going to need an array of names and an array of sales. And then I'm going to need some way to get some data into it and then I'll need to be able to run these calculations on it. But we haven't even really talked about how to calculate the highest of an array and the lowest of an array. But again, you just use a loop. You could write a function to do it. Let's go add uh, some functions to our code to calculate the highest and the lowest value. So up here, int highest, we're going to take an array, int ia, or ai, whatever we've been using, yeah, ai subscript, in subscript, comma, int 8 size. Now to calculate the highest value of an array, what you do is you set one value equal to the first element in the array, and then you iterate through the rest of the array, and if you ever find any larger values, you set that one value equal to that larger value. So, how about this? Int high is equal to ai subscript zero. That's our temporary, you know, what, we're going to give this a shot. We think that the first number might be the largest, but then we're going to use a for loop to check the rest. Or int i is equal to zero. I could optimize that slightly. i is less than a size i plus plus if ai subscript i is greater than high and i forgot my parentheses i was starting to type in python momentarily if parentheses ai subscript i greater than high then high equals ai subscript i and then return high If you were going to calculate the lowest, you would only have to make a very few changes to the logic. Yeah, and say that the word high was replaced with low. What's the only other change you would have to make? It'd be in this line. Right, you'd, you'd say if AI less than I, or is less than, high, than low, then the low equals that. Exactly. Back to this idea. Let's get our program to ask for some names. Let's ask how many names. Or, or maybe we'll just hard code the list of names. And then let's ask for the sales for each person. I'm just going to do that down here in main. So, string names, subscript for. And let's go ahead and give some names. Joe. Harvey. Ike. Whatever. And Sam. 
that goes in alphabetical order. C, D, F, G, H, I, J, whatever. Okay, I'm going to make this bill so that they're in some sort of alphabetical order. Now I want an array to hold their sales. It's going to be a parallel array, so it needs to be of the same length. How do I calculate the length of that array? Yes, I could hard code it to four, but that's that's cheap and nasty. How do I calculate the length of the array? Size of the array. Yep, the size of the array divided by the size of a string. So int or const int num names equals size of names in parentheses divided by size of a string. Then we could just use a for loop. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than num names, i plus plus, we're going to print out that name and then we're going to ask for the sales. So for Let's see, int i is equal to zero, i is less than num names, i plus plus. Let's see out arrow, arrow. What were the sales for space, end quote, arrow, arrow. Names, subscript I, arrow, arrow, quote, colon, or question mark, space, and quote, semicolon. And then let's read it in. CIN, arrow, arrow. Oh, I don't even have an array yet. I forgot to allocate an array. If I did, I'm going to call it sales, so C-I-N, error, error, sales, subscript, I. But I don't have a sales array yet. So before I go into that for loop, I better allocate one. Double sales subscript num names. And let's set them all equal to zero just for funsies. Remember that that doesn't actually set them all equal to zero. What it does is it sets the first one to zero, and then the rest of them default to zero anyways. If I change that to one, it would not reset them all to one. It would set the first value of one, and the rest of them would be set to zero. If we wanted to reset them all to a specific value, we could use our reset function that we wrote up there. All righty. That ought to do it, and we ought to be able to print our data out now. So C out, error, error, sales report, backslash in, in quote, semicolon, and then a for loop, just like that one, so much like that one that I am not ashamed to just copy and paste it. And then see out names subscript I arrow arrow quote backslash T just to get a nice tab in there. End quote arrow arrow quote, dollar sign, end quote, arrow, arrow, sales, subscript, I. Arrow, arrow, E-N-D-L. 
And yes, we ought to use I/O manipulators, you know, to format it so that there be two decimal places after the, the sales, because that's how we humans like to see our money printed out in dollars and cents. We screw Americans. Okay. Might work. What were the sales for Bill? 20, 30, 40, and 50. And there's our little sales report. 20, 30, 40, and 50. And we already have functions for calculating the low and the high and the average or whatever. We didn't write a function for average, but we did write one for calculating the sum. We can use the sum function we wrote to calculate the average. So double total equals the sum of sales, comma, and how many sales do we have? Yes, I could say four, but I actually had a variable dedicated to the number of sales, num names. Now, doesn't it look funny in a way to be, uh, ooh, here we have an error. That function is expecting an array of doubles, excuse me, an array of ints, but we're passing in an array of doubles. What could I do to fix that? I could provide another function of the same name that accepted doubles. And I feel like doing that. So I'm going to scroll back up to my sum function up here. And I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to paste it. And I'm just going to change the word int to double in a couple of places. So this new version is going to I replace that word with double. I replace that word with double, right? Its return type is double. Its parameter type is double. And what it returns is a double. So those are the three things I changed. So for that one, that one, and that one. But I left the other one alone. So now we have two different functions, one that accepts an array of ints and one that accepts an array of doubles. So down here, when I do that, double total is equal to the sum of the sales, and then the double of the average is equal to the total divided by num names. Now what I was about to say before I noticed the error is it looks funny to say sales and then num names, but why does that work? Because the number of sales is equal to the number of names, right? Because they are parallel arrays. If you felt like creating another variable called num sales and, e and then setting it equal to the value of num names, that would work. Yeah. Or we could even calculate the length of the array while we're here. Yeah, same way, int num sales is equal to size of parentheses sales in parentheses divided by size of double. If it makes us feel good to do that, we could do that and then divide like that. Either approach is fine. If you want to make a separate variable name that makes it look like it corresponds with the data type, fine. If you just want to use the original size of the array because they are parallel arrays, so they're all going to be the same length. And I guess I'm going to print that average out. See how averages, dollar sign, end quote, arrow, arrow, average, arrow, arrow, India. And there are build errors. Aren't we using total twice? Yeah, are we? That's exactly what happened. So how about total Double total sales is equal to that, and double average sales is equal to total sales. And then print out average sales. I just changed a few variable names to get it to compile because I was already using those variable names elsewhere.
So I know we've already done an example of parallel arrays, and now we've done another one, and the homework is going to, of course, on parallel arrays. What is the average series? Average series. Sorry. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to make a, a silly little change. I'm going to come up here and delete the word is, and I'm going to replace it with backslash t. And it's going to make our data line up when we print it out. What else? Using backslash t to tab things out is the lame way of doing it. We should be using IO manipulators and setting the minimum width. We have all these cool little functions here, but they all took ints. We could copy them and overload them so that they also work with doubles, right? Like we might want to reset all of our sales to zero or whatever, so we might want to make a version of reset that took doubles. We might want to print them out. We might you know, want to be able to calculate the highest sale. We would have to modify this so that it took an array of doubles and returned a double and so on. I think that we have gone of looking at to a reasonable conclusion. Two-dimensional arrays. A two-dimensional array is a grid, like a spreadsheet, rows and columns. You declare them like this. You give a data type, but inside the subscript, instead of just specifying one value, you use two subscripts for the number of rows and the number of columns. So if we declare a, an array that is four rows by three columns, then it has 12 spots, right? Four times three. And so that's row zero, column zero. That's row zero, column one. That's row zero, column two. That's row one, column zero. That's row one, column one. Row one, comma two. That's two zero, two one, two two. And three zero, three one, and three two. Use two subscripts to access the element. If you want to change this element right there and store the value 100 in it, you would do exams one subscript, two subscript equals 100. And when you're ready to print them out, you use a nested loop. What I'm wondering now is how do you size up to get the number of rows and the number of columns in a two-dimensional array? And I honestly can't think of a way to do it. But let's play with declaring a two-dimensional array. Go down here right above your pause statement and let's make a two-dimensional array of ints. So int, I'm going to call it TDA, the two-dimensional array, subscript, it's going to be a five by, th no, it's going to be a three by two array. Three by three. So subscript three, subscript three. And now let's fill it in with some values. Now this set, this declarator is going to look weird. So equals curly brace and then hit enter and then do another curly brace and type in three numbers separated by commas. Close that curly brace, put a comma there and do the same thing on the next line. I'm trying to make them all single digits. Like that. That looks a little silly. But that is how you initialize with an initializer list a two dimensional array. Don't type what I'm typing. I'm performing a mad scientist experiment. Yeah, I didn't think so. All right. 
In this particular case, again, since we have an initializer list, we could have left out the numbers of rows and the number of columns. But honestly, I don't remember how to get those values back using size up. But what we should do is we should declare constants. Right? So const int rows equals 3, comma, calls equals 3. And then just replace those threes in here with rows and calls. So if you're going to print it out, you need a nested loop. The outer loop is going to have a row as a loop control variable, and the inner loop is going to have a column indicator as its loop control variable. I could call them R and C for row and call. I'm just going to use R and C. So four parentheses int R is equal to zero. R is less than rows, all caps. R plus plus. And the inner loop, four parentheses, int C is equal to zero, C is less than calls, all caps, C plus plus. Now in here, I'm going to C out, space, space, TDA, that's the name of our two-dimensional array, subscript R in subscript, subscript C's in subscript. Maybe followed by a space. So, arrow, arrow, quote, space, quote, semicolon. And this is like typing on a line, you know. We're printing out column after column, but when we get to the last column, we want to go to the next. So outside of our inner loop, after the inner for, we're going to just print out an ENDL. And we're getting to that aggravating point where every time we run it, we have to type in data. But there's my little 3x3 three three array. If you were going to sum a 3x3 three three array, or, or any array, it would look the same. right? If we wanted to sum up all those values, we would declare an accumulator value up at the top. And then, heck, let, let's write that. Just copy your entire print loop here. Or we could even do it while we were printing it out. But anyways, and then paste that. But let's make a few changes. Let's declare, I guess it could be an int, int sum TDA is equal to zero. And then instead of printing anything out, let's add that value e to sum TDA. So it's the innermost inner part of our loop. Sum TDA plus equals TDA subscript R in subscript, subscript C in subscript. We don't need to be printing anything at all. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to take out some extraneous braces. There. This calculates the sum of our two-dimensional array. If you like curly braces, leave them in. If you wanted to calculate the highest value in the two-dimensional array, you'd do it just like we did with the one-dimensional array. Right, you set a value equal to the first element and then you keep comparing and if you ever find one that's higher, you set that value equal to that one. Oh, why not? Int high TDA is equal to TDA subscript zero in subscript, subscript zero in subscript. Now take your double for loop here, copy that, paste that, and as its innermost state, say if, parentheses, 
TDA, subscript R in subscript, subscript C in subscript is greater than high TDA, then high TDA equals TDA R C. And if I was cool, I would put these in functions, right? So that I wouldn't have to repeat them every single time I wanted to figure out, you know, the highest value of a two-dimensional array or the sum of a two-dimensional array. But we may as well print that stuff out since we've already calculated it. Highest in array is Space quote error arrow I T D A error arrow N D L and then C out sum of array is space end quote error arrow sum T D A error arrow N D L. That's going to work. I did a lot of typing without ever checking it. Yep. So the highest in the array is 9. Looks good. The sum of the array is 37. Well, I'm not going to add it up, but sounds good to me. So here's a question. How would you add up all the numbers only in the first row, or the first column, right? How would we figure out what the sum of the values in the first column are? Zero. Yep. You would do the same kind of thing we're doing here, except you would, you would hardwire Let's, uh, if I can get this up here. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. So, sum of column zero is TDA row zero column 0 plus TDA row 1 column 0 plus TDA row 2 column 0. That's the kind of thing that to me looks like a good thing to put in a uh, function so that we could specify which column we were doing. So we could say, you know, column is equal to zero, and then the TDA is equal to that column plus, no, wait, I've done that wrong. Yeah. Column there, column there, and column there, like that. And of course, you would you would put this in a loop like that. If you're going to do rows, instead of fixing the column equal to the same value the entire time, you would fix the row equal to a certain value every time, and then you would increment the column instead. So the sum of row two is set a row variable equal to two and then TDA of row subscript 0 plus TDA of row subscript 1 plus TDA row subscript 2. Like that.
What if you were looking at a value and you wanted to find out what the value to the up, to the north, and to the south, and the east, and the west were? Of course, this would be a lot more interesting if we had a larger array than that. But if we wanted to like add up the values to the north, the south, the east, and the west, then what you would do is you would have an xy coordinate, right? And then you'd get x minus 1, comma y, and you'd get x plus 1 minus y, and you'd get x y minus 1 and x plus 1. And you would have to take care to make sure that those minus and those pluses did not exceed the bounds of the array, right? Because if it got to le be less than zero when you were doing minus, then that's past the edge of the array. You wouldn't want to be able to do that. Or if you did plus one, and it got to be greater than n, where n is the equal to the number of rows or the number of columns, again, that would be a problem. Summing the columns of the two-dimensional array, it's just pretty much what we were talking about. Here we have an array called scores. It's got three rows of five scores apiece. So the rows is equal to three, columns is equal to five. And then we write a for loop. where they're incrementing a column counter from zero out to the maximum number of columns. And then inside it, they have a for loop where they iterate for each row, picking up the column number from that. Arrays with three or more dimensions. Well, guess what? You could create an array that had four dimensions, an array that had 20 dimensions or whatever. If you're going to do that, though, you would not probably use an initializer list. Can you imagine trying to do one of these things here, like the, where'd it go, for a three-dimensional array? Ah, you could. Here's what it would look like. But I'm not going to spend too much time working on it. Int 3D, you know, X, Y, Z is equal to... And it would have one two-dimensional array, and it would have a second two-dimensional array, and it would have a third two-dimensional array embedded inside it like that. Now let me take out some of the extra space. What a fourth-dimensional array. You could do it. Or if yeah, there are six, I'm certainly not going to sit here and show an example of declaring one. <laughs> right? So that's one line. You can see that a multi-dimensional array is just an array of arrays, really. Like that. There. Now we have our cute little three-dimensional array, and it looks like I've done something wrong. I'm pretty sure I have. supposed to be a three by three by three array. Well, that seemed to work. Okay, anyways. And we can play with that. Oh, I see. Yeah, like that. And tab it over and make it look pretty. But you, but you get the idea. Past a certain point, you would not use an initializer like that for, you know, handling, you know, multi-dimensional arrays of any dimension greater than two. It'd be kind of silly. But we can see how this works, right? But this is your top level of your array, and this is the second level of your array, and this is your third level of array where they were stacked on top of each other. Did you have an array of arrays and of arrays? Yep. Yeah. 
So when you use as a parameter, you specify all but the first dimension in the prototype. So we were going to pass this two dimension, this three dimensional array in to a function. We would have to do something like this: void, you know, sum 3D, and we would take an array of ints. like that. Now, honestly, I don't know why you don't just specify that as well. I'm going to go and paste this down here at the bottom, and we're going to be about done today. Yeah. Why did they tell us to leave off the first number in that slide? I don't know. All right, all we have left is something called a vector. We will save that for next time. What a vector is, is it's a dynamic data type. An array is fixed in length. Once you declare your array to be a 10 elements long, you can't go and add an 11th and a 12th and a 13th. Vectors grow as you add items to them. They start off of zero length, and then you start appending items to them. And then they shrink. In Java, they're known as array lists. In Python, they're just known as lists. Python doesn't even have arrays, so everything is a vector in Python, and they're called lists. All right, let's make a Dropbox. Let's do the homework assignment that I was talking about. Write a program that will prompt the user for the highest temperatures in the months, January through December. Feel free to, to uh, and abbreviate Jan, Feb, Mar, April, and so on. Display the results. Display the highest temperature. Display the lowest temperature. And as a stretch goal, try to get it display the month with the highest temperature and display the month with the lowest temperature. Now the catch in doing these little stretch goals is that what if two months had the same high temperature, right? How would you figure out how to print both that January and February had the lowest temperature? Of both June and July had both the lowest temperature. That's why I made it a stretch goal. If it's extra credit, go ahead and try to get that done. That's hard. You know, and so the output, you know, you, you can come up with your own output. You don't need me to, to, to give you sample output. Makes sense. Everybody's psyched up about that one, I can tell. Alrighty, gang. Let's uh, make a Dropbox and we'll be done for today.